And what I want to do is I want to go back and put it in its proper context where the issue of leaven is used. And it's being used specifically in the book of Leviticus and it's being applied to the offerings. That's where it's actually being used. It's being applied to the offerings of which were to be, the, uh, the offerings were to be burned at the altar. This is exactly what's supposed to be used. I know that's not how we use it, but that's how it was supposed to be used in the Old Testament. So let's pick this up um, and start in verse 4. In Leviticus chapter 2, verse 4. Now when you bring an offering of a grain offering baked in, on, it, baked in an oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers spread with oil. If your offering is a grain offering made on the griddle, it shall be of fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. You shall break it into bits and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. Now, if your offering is a grain offering made in a pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. When you bring in the grain offering which is made of these things to the Lord, it shall be presented to the priest and he shall bring it to the altar. The priest then shall take up from the grain offering its, uh, its memorial portion and shall offer it up in smoke on the altar as an offering by the fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. The remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, a thing most holy of the, of the offerings to the Lord by fire. So we, we, we're given a, 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 a clear description of what's taking place here, right? Uh, here we're taught that the notion of uh, leaven, the notion of leaven as a symbol, it's representing the um, presence of sin. Okay? And, and of sin, and it remains valid beyond the context here of the Passover, because that's what that we're talking about here, okay? And it continues all the way into the New Testament. You see this in Matthew chapter 16. You see this also in, um, in 1 Corinthians in chapter 5, okay? And so then, it, and, it, and we're told that it's to be spread with oil, right? Uh, we saw that here in verse 4, right? Now, when you bring an offering of a grain offering baked in the oven, it should be unleavened cakes of the fl of fine flour mixed with oil, unleavened water, spread with oil. Uh, literally, it, it, it's literally talking about the anointing with oil. That's literally what it's saying, anointing with oil. Anointing um, typically or usually is uh, reserved for uh, human appointments by God. Here... It, was, it is applied to the preparation of a holy thing, a holy sacrifice set apart as a memorial to the Lord. That's how it's being used here in uh, Leviticus chapter 2, verse 4. Now, we read all the way through verse 10. Let's just briefly look at verse 11. Now, it says, No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall not offer up in smoke any leaven or any honey as an offering by fire to the Lord. Now, this commandment specifically applies to Leviticus chapter 2, verse 4 to 10. That's where it applies specifically, of which were to be burned on the altar. That's, this is very specific language here. Then he says... Not and it should not have leaven nor honey, right? So both yeast and honey are considered edible foods. Yeast and honey are considered edible, edible foods. It's considered that, okay? But were never to be used with grain offerings since both could induce fermentation, which symbolize sin. So leaven... I want you to understand something here. So now, this is, by the way, this is all symbolic language. And you have to understand the, sim the symbolism that's involved here. Right? So, leaven, okay, you have to understand it was edible. It's considered edible food. Okay. So is honey. Mm -hmm. However, 
both had the ability to ferment. That's the reason why. And fermentation, fermentation at this point, you need to understand something, okay? Fermentation at this point, right, in Leviticus, because this is where we draw the concept out of leaven, okay? Right here? It's a symbol, it's a symbolic representation of sin. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? It's a symbolic representation of sin. Now, I know that may be, I, I know that's obvious to you, okay? I'm not here trying to offend your intelligence. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I'm not trying to do any of that. I just want us to be on the same page at the same time for the same reason, for the same purpose, going the same direction. Okay? So when we get to this concept here of leaven, okay? That's what it represented. That's why it had to be on leaven, not leaven. So let's go into the explanation. That was just, let's look at the explanation. Leaven is used throughout all of the Old Testament to represent sin. That's how leaven is used in the Old Testament. It is to represent sin, probably because of its degenerative influence. Now, when you get into the New Testament, it usually signifies malice and wickedness in contrast to sincerity and truth. Okay? So, this is in the Old Testament. Okay? In the New Testament, okay, the idea of leaven, okay, it means malice, okay, it's, it's, this is how it's used. It means malice, okay, and wickedness. This is how it's used. So you have you have this you have this crossover from the Old Testament into the New Testament, okay? and which is always, by the way, leaven is always going to be the opposite or contrary. Okay, leaven is always going to be, okay? always. This is always, always going to be, okay, in contrast to sincerity. Okay? It's always going to be the opposite, or in contrast to, okay? Sincerity and truth. That's going to be 11. Mm -hmm. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, I want you to go into verses 6. However, Let's understand this. Let's start in verse 1. In verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's start in verse 1, please. And let's just work our way down into the text here. Verse 1. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. Now, you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. So we know that we have a young man who um, is sleeping with his father's wife. Okay? His mother has passed on. Uh, he's now, he's been remarried. This will be his stepmother. Um, and it's widely known in the church that he's sleeping with his mother's wife. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry, with his father's wife. And verse 3, For I on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him 
who has so committed this as though I were present because it was pretty obvious all the reports had reached Paul. This, you know, you didn't need a whole lot of firsthand account of this. There was plenty of eyewitness and corroboration that this was going on. Paul did not have to go to Corinth. Paul did not have to be present to render judgment on the issue. And that's what he was saying. And so he says here, he says now, uh, verse 3, For I am my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I were present in the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He said, and this is fancy language. He was excommunicated from the church. He got kicked out. He got kicked out of the church excommunication. Or as my father, my father-in-law would say, he kicking him out. Okay? He kicking him out. Okay? And that's what my father-in-law would say. But I want you to understand something. He got kicked out. Verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Now, notice that Paul, I, I find, I'm really fascinated with that Paul, who is speaking to a Gentile church. I, I don't know if you've grasped that idea. You know, Paul is speaking to a Gentile church. It has very little Jewish influence in it. But what I am struck with, is how faithful the Apostle Paul is to preaching the full counsel of the Word of God. He now injects Jewish concepts into a Gentile world, but he takes the time to explain it to them so that they understand. You know, the Apostle Paul never had the attitude, well, you know, I can't speak to my people because they don't have any education and, and they're poor and they have very little education and this is just too deep. They're not going to understand it. May God rebuke you. I, I'm amazed. I know this is a sidebar. I am amazed. I, I travel extensively around the world to teach and preach the Word of God. And I travel extensively. We're, tra we're training pastors all over the world. And, and the thing that amazes me is how many pastors I come across who tell me, well, my people, they don't have any education. They're not going to understand. It's just too deep for them. So I just kind of keep it really light and superficial. You know what? And I tell myself, you should be ashamed and resign from the pulpit. Because why would you insult, number one, God? Number two, why would you insult God, the Holy Spirit? Number three, why would you insult God's people? You, you, are you telling me that God and God, the Holy Spirit, God, the Father, God, the Holy Spirit, and God's people cannot comprehend anything that you teach? Really? Here is Paul speaking to Gentiles using Jewish Israeli concepts that they were not even involved with. Now, we just read the first five verses, right? Now, look at verse six. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover has also been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Can you see what Paul has done here? He explains directly exactly the language that he's employing, that he is using. And they understand it. We're the ones who don't get it. They got it. Okay. And they got it because later on in the second book of Corinthians, 
Not only was the young man excommunicated, he was thrown out of the church, right? Whereas my father-in-law says, kicking him out, okay? And, and what happens is this. And then what, this is what happens literally. Later on in 2 Corinthians, Paul admonishes the church, accept that brother back into the fold, back into the church because he has repented. This is Gentiles. And he's using Jewish concepts. But he explained it. Be, do me a favor, be faithful to the word of God in his context. Now, how do we illustrate this? Let's look at some form of an illustration of this. Okay? Jesus identified three forms of leaven. Three forms of leaven during his ministry. This is what Jesus did. The leaven of the Pharisees was an unhealthy emphasis on externalism. Externalism. So let's look at this. Let's look at this right here. Okay. I want you to look at this with me because, I, I, look, the, the, the greatest shame is that we just treat the subject superficially. Okay. So let's look at this first one. How he's treating leaven in the New Testament, albeit he's speaking to the Pharisees. That is true. So before you try to accuse me of trying to take a, he, uh, uh, a Hebraic concept and apply it to the Gentiles, no, 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 but it's quite easy to do. Nevertheless, look at this. He is identifying leaven, okay, with externalism. Now, you go, what is that? But this is how you and I use it. Legalism. That's how Jesus identifies leaven in the book of Matthew. Legalism. Legalism is alive and well in thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of churches all over the world. But thousands all over the world. Turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew, please. In Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Let's look at verses 14 to 16. Jesus is speaking to this issue. Okay? And I want you to see this with me. Go back down, and let's just back this up to verse 13, please. And this is, this is the part in the Bible where Jesus is conde he's actually condemning the Pharisees. That's what he's doing. Because of their externalism or legalism. In other words, externalism is that you want to look, everything wants to look just right on the outside while you're absolutely rotten in the inside, okay? But this is what he says. We're starting in verse 13. He says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. <laughs> you love the language, don't you? Because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from the people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. And he says, woe to you. <laughs> Man, you know something? I never want to hear that. I don't know about you, but I never want to hear woe to you. He says, woe well, to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. I mean, his, his, his adjectives are just endless. Look at this. He says, because you travel around on, look at this. He says, woe well, to you, scribes and Pharisees, because you devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on the sea and the land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you yourselves. Hey, you know, you're concerned, 
you know, you're concerned about me? <laughs> you're concerned about the language, the strong implications of the language that I utilize in communicating this truth? You're concerned about that? Look at Jesus' language. Look at verse 16. Woe to you blind guides who say whoever swears by the temple that is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. Wow. Whoa. Wow. That's the first one. Now here's the second one. Okay. This is of and this was the, um, uh, I said the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees, okay? So this was the Pharisees. This second one here, okay, is, it's, uh, the, this one was the denial of the supernatural. The denial of the supernatural, okay? We're going to just call this, the denial or not? Of the supernatural. And this was the sad juices. Okay. This is the third, this is the second group in which he's applying leaven to. Okay? The leaven of the Sadducees, okay? Uh, I forgot a D in there, sorry. The leaven of the Sadducees. Okay? This is that they denied the supernatural. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Now just hang left. Go to Matthew chapter 22. And uh, look with me over there in verse 23. And this was the major conflict that they were having with the Sadducees. So in Matthew chapter 22, verse 23, he says, On that day, some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus and questioned him, asking teacher and Moses. He says, asking Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies, having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for, her, for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers with us, and the first married, and the died, and then no children left his wife to his brother. So also the second, and the third, down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. Now, these were, these were, these were, this, these were religious idiots. They were playing word games with him. And Jesus called them out on it. Because look at this. Look at verse 29. But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken. You are mistaken. I love that. Mm -hmm. So we see this here. Okay, We see this in Matthew chapter 22, okay, and we're going to pick this up in verse 23 through 29, okay, he says, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God, this was the leaven inside the religious community, now we have a third group, Okay. This third group, okay, is we're going to call this world. We're going to call this worldliness, okay? Worldliness. And this was the leaven of the Herodians. Okay? So we have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. Turn your Bible to the book of Mark, please. Go to Mark. Chapter 3, verse 6. In Mark chapter 3, verse 6, 
And I want you to see this also here. Go to the beginning of that chapter. Start in verse 1. And this, by the way, this, is, uh, this was the issue, uh, it, actually what leads up to this was the healing on the Sabbath day. That's what leads up to this. Okay. So he says in verse 1, he entered again, Mark chapter 3, verse 1, right? He says, he entered again into the synagogue, and, and a man was there whose hand was withered, and they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to the, he said, and he said to them, is it lawful to do a good or to do harm on the Sabbath? I loved it. You know, Jesus just fascinates the living daylights out of me and how he thought things through. He said, well, let me ask you something. If it's not, if it's not, it's not lawful to do something good on the Sabbath, well, then is it lawful to do something bad? Or on the Sabbath you do nothing. I mean, just think about the implications of that for a moment. Think about the implications of that for a moment. If it's to do nothing, you can't even worship. It's the act of good, right? I mean, what would happen in the midst of worship on the Sabbath, and all of a sudden the power of God just <clears throat> drops down on the people? And they go, oh, oh, God, no, 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 God, wait, wait, tell my God, you can't do that because it's the Sabbath. I mean, just think about this. And so what we have here, he says, and they entered again into the synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was with it. They were watching him to see if he would heal, right? If, if, if he would heal. You know, these Pharisees, they were too much. And he says, if he would heal them. And so, and so they can accuse him. And look at verse 3. He said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to them, is it long? Now he turns around. He's got, the wither, he's got the guy here with the withered hand. And he says, it is lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath and to save a life or to kill. But they kept silent. See, they kept their mouth shut. They knew they were wrong. And after looking around at them with anger, look at this, look at this, look at this. God, the son got angry. It says, after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to them, stretch, uh, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. In spite of these fools, in spite of these idiots, I'm going to heal you. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Look at verse 6. The Pharisees went out immediately, conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. Isn't that wonderful? Just absolutely wonderful. That the church gets together with the world to destroy somebody. Leaven is alive and well today. It's alive and well today. Do we not see that today where so many churches have gathered now? on the political landscape, on the political landscape to get together with politicians to destroy somebody else. Isn't that absolutely amazing how leaven is alive and well today? So here's the question. We've looked at the explanation. We looked at the illustration. Now here's the question. How do we get to the application what would be the application of this if I'm walking with somebody and explaining how they're to conduct themselves? Well, I want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, please. Here's the application. The corruptive 
influence of a little leaven emphasizes the need for churches to practice church discipline when sin becomes rampant in the lives of members of a congregation. Listen to me very carefully. I find no joy whatsoever in church discipline. But I do not fear applying church discipline. We have had to publicly, privately, 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 when privately, privately, privately did not work, then we had to deal with it publicly, brought a church member up front and dismissed them publicly from the church. Where I asked the church if they would all stand with me and turn their back on the brother and dismiss him out the door until he came to a full state of repentance. And you say, what? Are you crazy? Or as my wife would say, what in the world? Yes. And I've had to do that because the scriptures demands that we implement church discipline. If you do not implement church discipline, you're going to have leaven, and leaven will take all kinds of twists and turns. that you have never envisioned or anticipated. This is the reason why so many churches are worldly. So many churches are more political, more cultural, more philosophical than anything else, but they're not scriptural. And the fear, listen to me, pastors, because I know what's happening. You guys are scared to death of implementing church discipline. If you are faithful to the scriptures, God will be faithful to you. I've had to do this now on four different occasions. In 34 years, I've had to do this four times. Recently, we had to do this, and, and just this past year, just recently, very recently, we were able to restore a brother back into the fellowship. Here's the problem. The problem is that you're more afraid of offending people and being offended than you are of offending God. The ministry is not for cowards. Listen to me, pastors. You either put your pants on or you put your skirt on, but you're going to have to make a decision because this teaching, the leaven, is going to drive you to the cross of Jesus Christ. Leaven, this teaching, this doctrine under the doctrine of sin is going to have to confront you and the church. Will you live by the word of God? And let me tell you something. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7 is exactly where Paul was willing to die. This, he, let me tell you something. You have to choose a hill to die on, and this was one that Paul was willing to die on, and this is one that I've had to now decide literally to die on four times in the ministry in 34 years. Did it get people upset? Of course it did. Did people leave? Of course. But all that did was reveal to me where the 11 was. That's all. Look what he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. He says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Don't you know that? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened, for Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Do you understand what I'm talking about? 
So you and I are going to have to make a decision. How are we going to teach this doctrine thoroughly, okay, completely and explicitly in the life of the church so that when it does come up, and I've taught this in very detail, so when the issue came up, the church understood immediately what was at play here. They understood immediately what had to take place here because there we now had biblical precedents, but we had a firm foundation and we had a biblical teaching on the subject and it was not just some superficial tongue-in-cheek thing. We went through it in detail so that when it happened, they were prepared for it. Church discipline is the healthiest thing that you can have in the life of the church. Otherwise, what you have is now you have the patients who are out of the asylum and they're running the asylum. Pastor, God called you to lead the sheep. And in the, and, and, and in the animal kingdom, you never find sheep leading the pastor. You thought this was some kind of antiquated doctrine, theological position. I would just kind of mention it and just move on. No. This is a real issue in the life of the church. And you're going to have to make a decision. Am I prepared to live on that hill with the word of God or am I prepared to die on the hill with the word of God?